Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our last lecture for the week. Hopefully it's been a bit of an exciting journey. I understand that a lot of the material we might have gone through pretty quickly, but the goal is to get you to be writing programs as fast as possible. So we're going to speed through some C syntax in lecture in last lecture and a bit more in this lecture. And then in workshops, you'll actually have a chance to practice. So don't worry if you feel you're not getting there yet. You haven't practiced at all, so it's no surprise that you're not feeling like a proficient coder in C. So today we are going to be talking about a couple of things. The first is, unsurprisingly, if statements. So you can't do very much in C if you don't have the ability to make comparisons between things or to select between different things. Like if you want to know if someone's older than 18 in a bar, you're probably going to need an if statement, whether in C or in real life. So C, like other languages, has logical and relational operators that let you do comparisons. So are these things equal? Is one thing greater than the other? Are these things not equal? C is interesting because in uh, most instances, comparisons will, under the hood, resolve to either a 0 or a 1. And as you can see up here, non-zero in a comparison is treated as true, and zero is treated as false. There is a Boolean type in C, like in Python, something that's equal to true or false. However, that's only just about to become part of the mainstream C language at the end of this year. It's been present in one way or another for a while, and I will show you how to use it. But don't be surprised if you're looking at some C code and you see that it's just using zero and non-zero values rather than true or false. But I do recommend that you figure out how to get the true or false thing working. We'll give you a few examples of how to do that because it's a nice clean way of structuring your code. Um, and as I say there, the true and false keywords will become part of C in 2023. And I think November of this year is when it's due to be ratified by the large organization of very nerdy C programmers. So if else in C is much like it is in Python, the syntax is a little bit different. So a couple of things that you should know about the language before we move on is that C is white space insensitive. So with Python, you want to make sure that you've got the right number of tabs, the right number of spaces. And if your friend is using tabs and you use spaces, you don't want to see your friend again. Um, but in C, instead of having this like tab and space war, we thought, you know, better to resolve that by instead just going with these curly parentheses. And it, everything inside a curly parenthesis is going to be part of a code block. So this is the same for those of you familiar with Python with a level of indentation. So instead of having a level of indentation, mark where the start of the block begins with an open curly paren and close it with a closing curly paren. Um, or you can use a semicolon to denote a line that's its own code block on its own if you're feeling very, very risky. And we'll see why that's going to be a bad idea in a few minutes. Um, there is no elif in C, but we do have else if, so that's another transition, and we'll, we'll see this in a sample program in just a moment. So here is our very first example for um, a C else if statement. And let's code this up and see what happens. So I'm going to be lazy and just code this up for you as fast as possible, and I'm going to take some shortcuts. And you'll learn about these shortcuts later. You'll see my opening main function looks a little different. I've ignored some of the stuff. And I'll do n equals 1, set myself a nice integer variable. Now this is not going to work in C, even if I write it like that and put a code block there. In C you're going to need braces around the conditional statement that you're trying to run. So let's do this. Now here I'm using the risky method of not putting in curly ones. And then oops. Okay, let's give this one a run. So clang else dot C. This time I'm going to put the flag after. It doesn't matter if you put the flag before or after. I'll call this else if. Oh, it's complaining. Uh, error expected a semicolon. So I'll show you the error message again because it's good for, for you to learn from the things I do wrong in lecture. 
says on line 13, character 45, there is an error, expected semicolon. And what it's telling me is I put the semicolon in the wrong place on that line. So let's fix that up. Because the cur close curly paren marks the end of a code block, but not the end of a statement, I put my semicolon in the wrong place. So now it should actually work. It'll still give me warnings though. So it says, note, that should be int, um, because we should, remember how in the last lecture we showed that you could return a value from the overall program? If I use the word void, it's not returning an int anymore, and that's wrong, and it doesn't like it. It'll still let the program compile though. And this illustrates the difference between warnings and errors in C. Now, ideally, you should be writing code that compiles with no warnings, but if you do, your code might still run. And so I've been lazy here. There we go. Uh, n is, was equal to 1, so n is small. One other thing to note here is that the case, sorry, the white space insensitivity of C. So if I do this, it's not going to care, it'll still run fine. There we go. Now, here is another potential pitfall of C. Equals is not equals to equals equals. Now, what do I mean by that? Any ideas? What does equals do in, a, in my program? Yeah? Great. What was your name? Mike. Michael. Yeah, so Michael's right. This is just the same in Python. Um, you can't use a single equal sign when you're doing a comparison. Single equals is assignment. It sets a variable to something. Whereas double equals is the thing that you actually use to do comparisons. Now C is also kind of tricky and you can use the single equals inside a comparison sometimes. If your compiler is nice, it'll give you a warning, but it'll still compile. And the reason is, we will see, and we'll see the reason in a second actually. Let's give this a try. Okay, so there are a few features of this program that I want to point out. The very first of these is what we call a hash define. So if we write the word hash define, and then some term, whatever we want to call this, in this case, the maximum class size, I'm only going to allow 50 people in my super special class next semester. And then what we want to replace it with. This is like a find and replace. So every time in the program that there's max class size, it's going to replace that with the number 50. And this is going to happen before anything else runs, before it's compiled, before any of that. When you finish, when I save this program and start the compiler, before the compiler starts its main job, it's going to run a second program called the preprocessor. And all this does in this case is going to find, look for every instance of the word max class size and swap it with the number 50. Now, why might this be a good idea? Why would we want to do this? Surely if we wanted to do a find and replace, we could do find and replace. Joseph? Yeah, that's exactly what we're on about here. This 50, in this case, is what we would call a magic number because it doesn't seem to have any reference to anything else if we just put it in there. Someone says, like, where did that number come from? What is it? But if instead I put max class size, it's clear to the reader, and it also lets me change the max class size everywhere that it appears in the program all at once just by modifying this up here. So one of the things we're actually going to require you to do in this class as practice for good programming is to never have magic numbers in your program. Now there'll be instances where you can argue that, you know, something isn't really a magic number, like if I'm comparing whether something succeeded or not, and I'm comparing it to zero or one, that's not really a magic number because in C all zeros and all ones behave a similar way for comparisons. So you might be able to get away with that in our class. And maybe in real life. However, we do highly encourage you to use hash defines wherever you've got these strange numbers or certain like values that are fixed everywhere in the program. And we will be deducting marks from your assignments if you fail to do this. It's a very small deduction, but you should um, still not do it anyway. Okay, so that's the first feature of our program. Then we have our pattern from last lecture. We're going to print something. We're going to ask for some input. And remember, if we're fee if we're getting input in and we're using scanf, we have to use the ampersand before the variable in which we want to fit things. So we're going to do an ampersand before class size. 
Our percentage D is our format specifier to read in an integer. And then I've got my, my beautiful comparison statement. Seems fine, nothing wrong with it. Um, and let's give this a run. Ooh, it's throwing me warnings. I've got a new compiler. That's, that's good of it. But let's give it a run anyway. So enter class size. I can see 10 of you. That's strange. I thought there were 50 people in the class. What did I do wrong? Michael, you've already uh, answered. Floor. Exactly. See? Easy question. Um, so it says even in the error, in the warning message from my compiler, ooh, um, it says even in the warning messages here that um, using the result of an assignment as a condition without parentheses. And then it says, note, use equals equals to turn this assignment into a quality comparison. So the compiler is actually being nice to us. If you use an old version of the compiler, it might not be as nice. The newer ones have cleaner error messages. And GCC and Clang also have different error messages. So let's run this with GCC quickly to see what it would do. Oh, it also produced, oh. Why did this not give us different error messages? Something I said yesterday. Yeah, and I've forgotten your name again. Yeah. Tahar. Tahar. Yeah, so if I do gcc-v, which is asking it, the program to give information about itself. Aha! It's Apple Clang masquerading as GCC, so I didn't get any new error messages. I'll have another way of showing it to you later. Um, okay, so let's fix that up. Simple change I need to make. If class size equals equals max class size, the program will work now. But I want to explain the behavior that just happened. Python might give you an error if you tried to do this, but C will actually let it run. And this is an interesting feature of the C language in that the result of, a, of an assignment is the result of the assignment. Now, what do I mean by that? If I set n equals to 3, and I ask you, if I set k equals to n equals to 3, let's assume there was a valid program around that, k would actually take on the value 3, because that was what the thing inside the parentheses evaluated to. That's a very special rule of C, that the value of the assignment is equal to the thing that was assigned. So if the thing was assigned was 3, or if it was 4, then k would become 3, or k would become 4. So when I ran the program before, and I entered in 10, this was if, if, if uh, class size equals max class size. So this isn't saying is 10 equal to 50. This is saying set class size equal to 50. And what is, if I do like k equals to class size equals to max class size, what will k be equal to? 50. 50. And is 50 a non-zero value? Yes. yes. And is non-zero a true or a false value in C? It's a true value. So because, 50, because this equals 50, and because 50 is true, it prints classes full. And that is one trap to watch out for and pay attention to your compiler warnings. There is also something you can do to prevent yourself from uh, getting around the compiler warnings, which is to add this flag. And let's see what happens. Now, what was previously a warning is now an error. So by adding dash W, capital W, error, it tells the compiler, okay, every time you would have previously thrown a warning, hey everyone, now make that an error and don't finish compiling. And this can be a way to get yourself in good habits. Okay, let's do two more quick examples and then we'll move on. Um, so we will just open these ones up. Looks like I haven't even downloaded them. Okay, here's another program. And I'm going to give you roughly one to two minutes to discuss with your neighbor what this, what you expect the output of this program to be. So go ahead, speak to your neighbor.
Okay, does someone want to tell me what you discussed in your group and what you think the answer will be? And if someone doesn't volunteer, I will volunteer you. Z is six. Z is six. Why do you think Z is going to be six? So, X is larger than two, so X is equals to three, so it goes to in second year. Y is, but Y is smaller than six, so it will not go into Z equals to seven. So it's just that directly finished to print it. Yeah. So let's give it a run and let's see. Let's just call it dang. Because I think that probably describes uh, how we're feeling about it. Oh no, I don't know what's Z is equal to A. Anyone else want to have a go at explaining why you think why Z has Z to be equal to A? Wait, just leave it to someone else. Leave it to someone else. Okay. Yeah, what was your name? Oh. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think uh, uh, two if conditions is uh, a minute equals n in Python. So that means x and y have to both uh, require uh, adapt to the requirement. So in the other case, uh, that would be eight. Just the uh, upper condition uh, is not uh, acquired. So basically, that is eight. So there's another guess. Any others? Someone else want to take a go at explaining it? Yeah, what was your name? Arden? Arden. Yeah. Awesome. So, the second is that if it's more like x is bigger than 2, that's why it goes to next step and there is y is But here the y is smaller than 6, so it goes to the next step and there is equal to 8 and it changes the value of 8. So let's put on our parentheses properly in C. I think Aaron was probably onto something. So if I press tab here, you'll notice that my text editor knows how to indent things properly. Yeah. This was just a white space tree. So if I was actually going to put in my parentheses, this is the same thing. Because remember, the semicolon is a tricky way of doing your open and close parentheses. So this is what it actually should have looked like. And now it's much more obvious to figure out what's going on. So if x is larger than 2, which it is, if y is larger than 6, which it is not, otherwise z equals 8. And so we're in this branch here, z equals to 8, so after the if statement, z is equal to 8. And this is exactly why you should not, um, you should not use this uh, dangling uh, semicolon to write your code. In fact, I'm going to skip the next demo, I think, and just remind myself what it was. Oh, no, we won't skip this one. So this is a very, very short demo. Uh, can, does anyone have an idea of what the output of this bit of code will be? Just quickly, is this going to work? Let's give it a try. It was not happy with that. Um, and I think I know why as well, but that was not what was meant to happen. Uh, what did I do wrong? Yeah, output file. So there was an old copy of three tests that was hanging out there. So after the two if statements, z equals 7, let's explain this one pretty quickly. So C does not allow you to write statements like this with the outcome that you'd expect. Instead, what's happening is there are missing parentheses. So remember that a comparison and, uh, equates to either 0 if it's false or 1 if it's true. And so what's actually happening here is these are being executed such that uh, you're replacing the output of those with the results of the comparison and then you're doing a second comparison after that, which results in the final output. And I would recommend, when I'm not going to explain exactly how the numbers work with this one. This is one to try on your own. Um, we'll publish that online. So we talked a little about traps to fall into with your if statements. 
and there was that annoying one with the semicolon, and you think, you know, no one could be that stupid, all you have to do is use your curly braces and everything works out fine. This is a piece of code, a piece of real code, that controlled much of the cryptography on the internet for a very significant fraction of time. Can anyone see something wrong here? So what happens with an if statement where we have a semicolon? Um, it would just like run, like it wouldn't take like the entire thing. Yeah, so if we have a semicolon there, what it's going to do is it's going to pretend that there's a code block. And so the code block is around, it starts with that if statement and then wraps around the go to fail. And the second go to fail is that in the if statement. So what's the program going to do when it hits that second if statement? Yeah, it's going to go to fail. It's not going to create an error in the normal sense, but it will go to whatever fail is. And so in this case, whenever the program ran, it would always go to the go to fail. And this resulted in a major security flaw that impacted tens of millions of websites on the internet. So here's another thing, important thing to know about uh, if statements. And that is, while a lot of functions will return 0 or 1 to indicate success or failure, a lot of the functions in C that come from the standard library, so that when we, when we include them, follow a different behavior. So most library functions return a special value to indicate that they have failed. The special value is typically negative 1, a null pointer, which we won't worry about for now, or a constant such as EOF that is specially defined for the purpose. Now, if you see something in all capital letters, this means it's probably a magic number. And in this case, EOF is another one of those magic numbers that we'll talk about a little later. So, this gets us onto the topic of checking for return values. We want to actually be sure that the functions we've been calling and the things we're doing are succeeding. And now that we have if statements, we can actually do this. So, let's do that for our printf and our scanf functions. So, scanf takes where here we are reading in three different things, we're reading in three numbers, and based on the code here, what do you, how, how do you think scanf works? How, what do you think the return value of scanf is? So Aeon, Aeon says the answer is three, and the answer, this would make sense given that this code says if it's not three, go to failure. Um, so scanf will return the number of items that is successfully read. And if I want to figure out what the return value of a given function in the C standard library is going to be, where should I look? The manual, whoever said that. I don't know, yeah. Okay, uh, special casing. This is a particular use of if and else statements that you, one has to be careful with. So in Python, in many times you would have said, um, you would have had instances where you would have done this special casing. And one beautiful place where it's actually appropriate as opposed to inappropriate is something like the days of, the number of days that there are in a given month. Why? There's no particular structure or rhyme or reason to why some months have 31 days, some have 30, and one of the months feeling a little left out has 28. So this is an example of where special casing, we're having specific if else statements that refer to very particular numbers make sense. Normally, if there's actually structure to your problem and you don't have to write an okay, this is the one that's 28, this is the one that's 31, this is the one that's 30, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't go out of your way to make special cases for things. However, with the months of the year, this works. So let's open up our, um, oh, I guess I don't have the code demo. So in this case, the length of the year is a special case. It's 365 days a year, which is, a special case because we're born on the planet Earth and the planet Earth goes around roughly three uh, after 365 days. The length of February is specific and also leap years again are something unique about our particular situation and not inherent to the structure of the universe. Likewise you can special case for all the other months and we'll come back to this in a few demo programs. Operator, operator. I have no particular reason for including that other than a match the slide. But these are all the operators in the C programming language, or at least the ones that we're going to care about. And in particular, the ones that we are going to focus on for the remainder of today 
are uh, these ones up here, which you should have seen almost all of these. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and ooh, a fancy new one, the modulo operator. If, if you're in Comp 101 and have seen the modulo operator before, can you put up your hand? Okay, so you've all seen the modulo operator, so I'm not going to harp on it for too long. We are also, oh, let me go back. And click again. The other ones that we're going to be uh, relevant for our class at the moment, can't get it right, are uh, the various comparison operators. So comparison, equality, and, or, and assignment. So let's check out the and operator very quickly. I'm going to be good this time, and I will do an int me. Okay, and it's two. You know what? I'll do this. I'm just writing a little basic program here, try and follow along. And I'm missing my slash ends to actually make new lines. So I'll run both of these right now, and you know, in fact, I'm going to make n equal to zero. So what do I expect to see on the, on the first line that's printed out? And on the second line? Okay, let's see. I call that clang and dot c. Now let's give it a run. There is zero and one, which is roughly what we'd expect. Using the double n symbol, we check that both m and k are truthy values, that is, values that evaluate to true. And in the second line, we checked that does at, are at least one of these a true thing. So you'll see another thing that I've done now is I've actually included uh, this extra header, standard bool.h, and this allows me to use the bool type, where I can set things directly to true or false. Uh, in the new version of C that we were talking about, which you should all be very excited about, because I'm very excited about it, uh, you won't need this anymore and it'll still work. And Clang might even let me, oh, it's not letting me do it, but if I do dash standard equals C to something like that, I'll figure out the flag later. There's some way of tricking it into using the feature even though it hasn't been released yet. Um, but we'll see that one a bit later. Okay, so all of you have seen, or almost all of you have seen the modulo operator. This just takes the remainder of a number. So if I do three modulo two, what do I get? One. C also does have order of operations, just like on your calculator or in Python or when you're actually doing maths by hand, hopefully you're following some order of operations. The rules in C for order of operations can get very, very specific. And on top of that, sometimes the order of operations is undefined in the standard. What this means is it's up to whoever writes the compiler to determine what in what order things should go. This gives the compiler author additional flexibility to make things run faster, but it can also be a bit of a trap if you haven't put your parentheses in the right place and you're expecting things to go in a particular order. So only and and only the double ampersand and the or symbols are evaluated consistently left to right um, and they terminate as soon as the answer is known. And what that means is if you have something that's false and then something that's true and then something that's true and then something that's true and then something that's true, then that's true the computer will stop as soon as it sees the first false thing, it's going to stop right away. Um, and that will end up, we'll see a couple demos of that soon. Uh, this precedence order, as I said, do not, does not always specify the entire order. So here's an example where we know that the two multiplications should happen before the addition, but we don't know which of the multiplications is going to happen first. 
So if instead of simple multiplications, you were relying on one of these multiplications to happen in a certain order, you could get in serious trouble. Any questions for today so far? No, we're all pretty happy? Okay. Another thing about C is, this, is that precedence only tells you what comes after something else and not what comes before. That's a little tricky, so I'll let you sit with that for a bit and figure out what it means. Okay, we will skip this demo because we just did it and we will move directly on to types for the last little bit of our lecture. So as you've already seen in our demo so far, C is pretty finicky about types. If something is an int, it's an int. If something's a double, it's a double. And when you start to mix them, stuff goes weird. So let's learn a bit more about types, um, and hopefully we'll get to some of the secrets of the universe that I planned for, for this week, but if not, we'll get there for next week. So ASCII is the first type of type we're going to learn about. This is the American Standard Code for Information Interchange, and all it is is really a way of representing letters on the computer. If you were to open up inside your computer, you would see electrical impulses, you'd see magnetism, you wouldn't see any letters. The letters are instead representations, they're abstractions on top of these electrical or magnetic impulses inside the computer. So just like we say that the electrical impulses correspond to ones and zeros, and groups of the ones and zeros correspond to numbers, we'll go one level further than that and say certain groups of numbers correspond to letters. And the, one of the early ways of doing this was ASCII, A-S-C-I-I. In C, the way we represent an ASCII character is through a type called ca uh, char. Char or car. I think I've heard it both ways. Car sounds awful though, so say char. Um, this is a data type for storing a single ASCII character. Now there's some complexity around this over whether what quite how large an ASCII character can be, but at including all the possible extended ASCII characters, there are at most 255 of them. Now how many of you speak a foreign language not written in Latin characters? Uh, just shout out the language you speak all at the same time. Arabic. Okay, so I heard Arabic. Other than Arabic, no one speaks anything else? Hindi? Urdu. Urdu? Okay, great. And do you think we have, in 255 characters, do we enough for all the punctuation, all the numbers, all the Hindi characters, all the Urdu characters, all the English characters? No. So unfortunately, ASCII is limited to the English alphabet, and if we want to start representing a broader and more diverse array of languages, much like the people we have in our room, um, we are going to need a different type. But more on that perhaps at the very, very end of semester when we'll talk about something called Unicode. So this, these are the 127 ASCII characters. There is an extended set that I mentioned that goes up to 255, but this is all we got, really. Um, so we have a select number of symbols. I don't see any emoji in there, which is disappointing. No, no smiley face. Um, and I don't see any Hebrew or Arabic or Hindi characters in there either. But one nifty thing is that everything is in the order with hope. So if we go A plus 1, what are we going to get? B, because A is 65 and B is 66. So at the end of the day, our ASCII characters are just numbers, and we can use the fact that they're numbers to play around with this quite a lot. So you can add 5 to the letter A and go A, B, C, D, E, F, for example. Um, so this seems pretty fine. Uh, we'll touch on ASCII more in the workshops where you'll play around with it a little. But now the bit where it gets a little trickier. Let's do some maths. Okay, uh, this looks like a familiar sight to many of you. If I start at 10 a.m. and I go three hours later, what time is it? And how do I know that? Assuming, assuming that I don't just know that in my head, how do I figure that out based on this picture? What would I do? Yeah, what was your name? Jennifer. Yeah, so I'm going to move the hour hand up three of the big spaces. So starting at 10, I move up to 11, I move up to 12, and then it starts over again. And so in C, our numbers are actually just like this. Unfortunately, the memory of our computer is not infinite, and so we have to cap it somewhere, and so we'll talk about where that cap is in a minute. But just like with a clock, once you get back to the top, you start back again. And, and exactly what number and how far you go, we'll talk about in a second. But this gives us a strange conundrum. Is there really a limit to how the computer can 
how high the computer can count? Well, it turns out for C, at the very least, there is. Um, and this is, we go all the way up, 1, 1 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, etc, etc. We add more bits, and we'll talk about binary representation probably early next week. Um, and then we get all the way to 2 to the 31. Can we get all the way to 2 to the 32 based on this picture? No. What, what's the biggest number we could get up to? 2 to the 32 minus 1. So just before we hit the 0, we've got one more integer that we can fit in there. Um, and this is what's known as a 32-bit system. Because if you have 32 ones and zeros, the highest you can count is up to 2 to the 32 minus 1. And we'll talk about binary now. So in the case of a uh, computer that's using ones and zeros to represent uh, our numbers, each bit is going to represent a different power of 2. So just like when you're doing maths in base 10, where each column is going to represent a higher power of 10, so the, you have the ones column, you have the tens column, you have the hundreds column, you have the thousands column, Hopefully all of you are still with me at this point. In base 2 we're going to do something similar. You'll have the 1's column, the 2's column, the 4's column, the 8's column, the 16's column. And the way we represent it, if we're going to add that number to our running total is by putting a 1 there if yes and a 0 there if no. So if I have a 1's column and a 2's column and I want the number 3, what will my number look like? Is there a 1 in the 1's column? Yes. Is there a 1 in the 2's column? Yes. That's my number 3. That's all the binary is, nothing to be scared about. So all you do is you, if you, you take your number, and exactly the process for working it out we'll get to in year 11, but you break it up into powers of 2, and then if it's an odd number you add that nice little 1 at the end, and using that way you can fit it into one of these clocks. As long as it's less than 2 to the 32 minus 1, because we only have 32 ones to play with, so once we get higher than that we're out of ones. But the computer has more, has more space for ones in it, doesn't it? I, I presume your computers have more than space for 32 ones and zeros. Okay, maybe, maybe we'll get back to that in a minute and see how we can use those. So 2 to the 32 is too small. What are some ideas for how we can fix this? What, what are some ideas? Use two computers? Okay, uh, I've, I've got two here. That, that's, that's one solution. I will put 2 to the 32 minus 1 on this one and 2 to the 32 minus 1 on that one. And then... Uh, Okay, uh, and then I, I guess I've got a third computer here, so we can store three numbers. What about some other ideas? Agrim, oh, you've answered a whole lot. Was it Jennifer? No. What was your name again? Floor. Where's Jennifer? Sorry. Hexadecimal, we're still going to have the same ones and zeros no matter how we write it. Hexadecimal is just writing in base 16. Uh, it was Michael, but you've already spoken. Yes. What was your name? Josh. So we could we could allocate some extra bits. Oh, that sounds like a reasonable idea to me. In fact, that's what I have on this next slide. So we could build a new computer, and this computer's design is going to be much better. I'm going to have twice the number of bits. So now I have 64 bits here, and I have 64 bits here, and I have 64 bits here. I still have three numbers, but at least they're bigger numbers. Now I can count to many billions. Um, but that still doesn't seem quite enough, so we'll come back to this in a second. We're going to call the number of bits that a computer is designed to operate on, whether it's 32 or 64, we're going to call that the size of a word. The word is the basic unit that our computer is designed to operate on. So there's going to be some circuit inside there, and the way the circuit is built most efficiently is to work on, say, 32 bits at once. Now, are most of your computers 32 or 64 bit, do you think? 64, yeah. 32 back when I was growing up, that was the normal thing. Now we're mostly on 64 bit, even inside your phones. So, uh, in the beginning was the word, and the word was 64 bits. Um, um, but that's still not quite big enough. Um, I have my three computers, and each of them has 64 bits, but I actually want to represent bigger numbers. So one way to do that is just to say, okay, uh, let's combine a bunch of different numbers inside the computer. If each number can only be a maximum of 12, well, if I have four clocks, then I can use each clock to represent extra bits in my number. So instead of having a 
uh, 30, let's, let's make these uh, 32 instead of 12 to, to make the, the numbers easier on me. So we'd have 32 bits and plus another 32 bits plus another 32 bits plus another 32 bits. How many bits is that? 128. So what's the largest number we could represent using all of these bits? 2 to the 128 minus 1. So this gives us some extra flexibility, much larger number, but because the circuitry in our computer is designed for 2 to the 32 or now 2 to the 64 bits, this is going to be much less efficient. And so C is going to make you work harder if you want to represent these numbers. Now there are all these libraries that you can add in to give you access to these, but for the most part 2 to the 128 is a really big number, and so the instances where we're actually going to want those bits are a bit limited, but it happens in cryptography all the time. Um, so there's our representation. We have 2 to the 31, 2 to the 31, 2 to the 31, 2 to the 31. Each of these are 32 bit numbers. Um, so C is smart enough to deal with this automatically? No, unfortunately, unfortunately not. So this is a program overflow.c. Does anyone recognize this number? No? It's a big number. 2 to the 32 minus 1, yeah, that's what it is. Okay, and what are we going to do to it? What are we going to do to it? We're going to torture our poor computer, and we're going to make it overflow. We're going to go bigger than the number of numbers that it actually has. Okay, so the first time I'm going to go 2 to the 32 minus 1 plus 1, and then I'm going to multiply by that by 2, and then I am going to... What am I doing here? BP1. Oh, and then I'm going to do uh, 2 to the 32 minus 1 plus 1 times 2. And if everyone have a pen and paper handy or a laptop or something, or a head. Um, what was your name again? Yeah. Uh, Riley. Riley. Okay. Um, so everyone write down what you think the outcomes of these four computations are going to be. So printing just the big number, printing the big number plus 1, Printing the big number times 2, and then printing big number plus 1 times 2. I'll give you about 15 seconds to this. We're going to be really fast. Let's give it a run. Ooh, mystery results. And we are going to leave explaining the outcome of this program to the next lecture. Um, keep these in mind. Come back next lecture with an explanation of what you think is going on. This is your homework for Tuesday. Thank you very much, and I will see you all then.